Good evening, Lisa Wolpe. Thank you so much for being on our show. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you. If we could start with a very fairly general um, question. You founded the celebrated, the famous company by now, the Los Angeles Women's Shakespeare Company in 1993, with an aim to produce uh, professional productions of um, Shakespeare's plays with an all-female ensemble. Um, so if I could just ask you, why Shakespeare and why all-female cast? Um, what's it all about? <laughs> <laughs> well, Shakespeare, because it's the cathedral of English language. It's the best writing I have ever experienced. And all female, because originally the company was all male and women were not allowed to write for or play on public stages. And a multicultural company, never more than 50% white, because in the United States we are 50% non-white. So we're aiming to bring our voices onto the stage and into the world. Shakespeare, of course, um, is celebrated as probably together with maybe Miguel de Cervantes, Spanish classic. It's a literary triumph of his era, and uh, he's celebrated also, of course, as, as a timeless classic. But um, Shakespeare, of course, is a product also of a particular context of his own Elizabethan, late Renaissance, early modern times. Um, and he very much reflects gender roles of the period. So what can Shakespeare tell us about gender in today's day and age after centuries of feminist struggle, after decades of academic work in gender studies, queer studies, sexuality studies, so on and so forth. Well, if you remember that Queen Elizabeth was basically paying for the plays, yeah, this was an incredibly intelligent woman who had a tremendous amount of power. So the plays that would please her ear are plays that celebrate the complexity of a person beyond gender. Queen Elizabeth herself presented herself as beyond gender. And the all-male company that originally did the plays were exploring gender and socio-political power from both a male and female point of view. So now that you know women are buying 68% of the theater tickets in the United States and uh, now that we are doing Shakespeare in a way that is revolutionary I think the poetry the philosophy and the politics are more interesting than a tweet do you know what I mean uh, communication that's now reduced to Facebook posts and tweets of 140 characters are enriched by the 60-word sentence, do you know, by the rhythm of your heartbeat in the poetry. And to be able to be heart to heart and eye to eye and mind to mind through this great lens of brilliant poetry and politics is perfect for the women and the queer and the trans community today. But you have many um, characters or, or plays or texts that uh, feminists would may find problematic in this day and age. Most famously, of course, the taming of the shrew, shrew yep. with uh, Kathleen's character, when mm -hmm. we have this very um, free, freedom-loving woman who is then broken into becoming an obedient bride and, and, and wife. Uh, and we have many, many cases in Shakespeare's text when we, we encounter definitions of what is feminine, what is masculine, and what, what is supposed to be feminine or um, masculine, like for example with Lady Macbeth, when she decides to follow her husband famously, she prays for the spirits to unsex her and therefore uh, enable her to become um, cruel, meaning that it's not natural for a woman to be cruel. On the one hand, we, of course, in Shakespeare as plays and in his company, we had fluidity, we had gender performativity, men performing women, and then within plays, women becoming men and so on and so forth. But also we have these cases where it's supposed to be strictly delimited. First of all, in London at the time, in the town, there was a lot of cross-gender experimentation in society. It wasn't as though everyone in London was cisgender and behaving a certain way, and on stage they were crazy. The stage work was a reflection of what was happening in the town. Very, you know, interesting, when you talk about Antony and Cleopatra, they, in their time, thousands of years ago, wore each other's clothes in the streets, yeah? And so I've directed Taming of the Shrew five times, three times all female, and it's always interesting to me to look at what Petruchio learns, you know? And so in a male-directed performance, you might just look at the subject 
subjugation of women, or if you had a, a male body that was larger that could uh, smash the woman's body, you might say, here is the power and this is not the power. But in the interplay of how to make a relationship, taming of the shrew can be a useful prism. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it's still an unfair project. She's made to be cold and hungry, and is, she's never beaten, and that way it's supposed to be a progressive uh, at its time. Uh, but it's definitely a frightening play, and you can direct it any number of ways. Um, Unsex Me Here for Macbeth, it's possible that Macbeth was the first play written for King James, who was a bisexual king who was a misogynist and burned thousands of women alive thinking they were witches. He was afraid of women. And so that play would have pleased him more than it would have pleased Queen Elizabeth. So always look at who paid for the plays and what did they want people to think about the female sex. Do you think in that time, in that period, there was more acceptance of gender fluidity, cross-gender uh, performance, at least on the stage, if not in the social life, but also in social life as well, than it is now? Uh, and what are the perceptions of the, your audiences? And also, is it different, for, um, is the perception different when a man performs a, a woman's role or a feminine role and vice versa, when a woman I think the fear is that if women were to work with women on this kind of empowerment, they would all become lesbians, do you know? And the fear is that if men show their feminine side, they are then gay, and in some way they're attacking the masculinity of the nation or the femininity of the nation. Uh, that's the um, attack on same gender work in Shakespeare's time from the Puritans who shut all the theaters down, uh, that an actor could be so bold as to talk about God and gender and politics uh, outside of what was prescripted in a puritanical view of the world was dangerous. And yet, they called it the Globe Theater only you know, a decade or so after they found out that the world wasn't flat. So they were celebrating what was new. They were celebrating uh, finding out about international people you know, not long after the Moroccan ambassador came to London, they wrote Othello. So the more that there is travel and an exchange of ideas, the more the playwright can talk about something important. Really, at the end of the Shakespeare plays, you're looking at the despair in the political process, in Coriolanus, in Timon of Athens, the hopelessness of politics. And in the early plays, you're looking at romance and entertainment and comedy. So when men play women, often it's comic because they're joking about, if I didn't have so much power, I could also be fabulous, and you know, I could use my hands in this way, and I could move in this sexy way that you haven't seen before, and I can have my power and my masculinity, and also everything a woman has, a little silver, a little mascara, a little this and that. And often when women play men, it's about power. If I could tell you directly how angry I am, I would. Do you know? Or if I could tell you directly how I want the world to change, I would. But women are often asked in life to be indirect, to smile, to break the angles of their body, to give their space away. And men often take the space, yeah? So if you're in an airplane, you have to fight over the armrest because he is expanding and she is folding. So we're just asking for parity, that everyone take up equal space on the stage, in the world. But that's a huge amount of concession on a man's part. And it's a step forward on a woman's part. Um, sometimes I feel like Shakespeare saved my life. This is, you say this um, in the beginning of your uh, performance with which you're touring now um, Prague and, and which we had uh, the pleasure of seeing um, a couple of days ago. Before we continue, we would like to see a short segment um, from the show, which also includes a brief demonstration of, of your Romeo. Oh, nice. Sometimes I think that Shakespeare saved my life. I fell in love with Shakespeare when I was just 19 years old. It was a time when I needed that bigger conversation in order to express what my own family was not willing to discuss. Lots of tragedies. I looked to Shakespeare to explore the theme. You know, if you take two Stradivarius violins and place them in opposite corners of the room and pluck the A string of one, the A string of the other one will start to vibrate in sympathy. That's how humans are. 
Our bodies are like tuning forks, and the more that we let love ring through us, the more healing we experience. Just running the language of Romeo and Juliet through my body opens and strengthens my heart. He jests at scars that never felt a wound. It's soft. What light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Rise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief that thou her maid art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, for she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. Oh. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks. Yet she says nothing. What of that? To you, uh, when you perform uh, these very famous male roles, Shakespearean uh, men, um, and so many years have passed that you've been, you have such rich experience already of doing that, uh, do you still get a sense of uh, you doing a cross-gender adventure, or do they, these roles already come naturally to you, to you, like you know them so well that Romeo is just a Romeo? I'm more comfortable playing Romeo than Juliet. You know, I used to start my show, I did the entire balcony scene of Romeo and Juliet playing both genders, because I wanted to prove that every 10 seconds I could change gender, and I became very good at it, so I had to cut it, because I didn't want my show to be about wonderful performance pieces that I could do brilliantly. I wanted to unpack something about this work, about what it is in the masculinity through my body that I find interesting. And, um, you know, Juliet is a 13-year-old girl, and I'm somewhat androgynous, and to play a perfect Juliet, I have a very high standard. But there's really nobody else on the planet who's a woman who's played Romeo that I know. So I feel I'm unparalleled. I get to work. Uh, very strongly on my own. And also, Romeo was the first role that I picked for myself. Oh, I had wanted to do the play in Clown, because I worked for many years in Red Nose Clown, and I wanted to do the love of Romeo and Juliet, like Parzival, a clown play that I had written and performed, The Innocent Love in a Dangerous World. And as I was waiting to see if I got the grant to fund the production, I was looking at the text, and I fell in love with the poetry. And uh, I didn't get the money, and I thought, well, I'll just do the whole play, all female, and play Romeo, and show the love that I have for women through this lens, how I would be romantic, how I could be uh, a perfect boyfriend, do you know? And how this play ends in suicide, which is another question that I have in my life. And so why Shakespeare always comes down for me, how did it save my life? It's because I had words to express myself and I had an audience who could hear that range of myself outside of my family. In those days, my family was not interested in having a lesbian in the family. It was the first one in my whole family and it was dangerous. But through the world of theater, I could look at love and romance and that was a gift to me because I did it in a small theater and it was sold out so sold out that we extended it, so sold out that we did the second one, which was Othello, and the third one, which was Hamlet, and the fourth one, which was Richard III. And then we became uh, local celebrities that in Los Angeles you could always see an all-female multicultural Shakespeare done brilliantly by this troop of women who could do Shakespeare, you know, old school, you know, with the poetry and the syntax in place. Not a concept about, look at me, I'm a woman. The play itself but a woman doing it. So when I play Hamlet and I say, frailty, thy name is woman, it's on layers. I'm playing Hamlet, and in that moment, I'm believing that the weak ones are Ophelia and Gertrude. Mm. But the audience knows it's Lisa. We've seen her for 20 years. She's a woman. <laughs> right now, she looks like a man, but she's a woman saying something political and personal at the same time. So it's time. subversive. Yeah, well, it is subversive and it's revolutionary, yeah. I hope so. What is also very remarkable in the show that we saw is the, the very natural and logical um, connections that emerge 
uh, between Shakespearean characters in today's day and age. And if we, we, we would like to show uh, one more clip from um, the, the same segment when you're still discussing Romeo and Juliet and um, pointing out the patriarchal power embodied by the Lord Capulet and then posing a very poignant question, are, have we started listening to our children now after so many centuries? Let's um, just watch that video. Juliet's father, Capulet, tells her that she must marry the wealthy county Paris. Hey, beg, starve, die in the streets! For by my soul I'll ne'er acknowledge thee, nor what is mine shall never do thee good. Trust to it, bethink you, I'll not be forsworn. Her mother says, talk not to me, for I'll not speak a word. Do as thou wilt, for I have done with thee. But Juliet loves Romeo and makes her own choice. Like Icarus, they crash to the ground, their wings melted by the heat of the hatred all around them. At the end of the play, both Juliet and Romeo commit suicide. Some would have us believe that those two children's souls will be condemned to hell forever for that final act. But I just can't believe that. What does the story teach us? Has the community learned to listen to its children? So the world hasn't changed much, and Shakespeare is indeed as relevant today as he was in his time. Do you Surprisingly think? so. You know, on Facebook, there's a secret group in the United States called the Pantsuit Nation, so that after the election of Donald Trump, Millions of people are posting stories about their interracial families or their same-sex love or the hate crimes that have uh, flooded through our country in the last two weeks. Um, yesterday, my friend's hand was blown off in a letter he received. He's a gay activist in Philadelphia. Um, I can give you a list, but there's a thousand since two weeks ago. And so, I don't know, can watching Shakespeare make a difference? Uh, yes, I think it can because you can bring your story to a community that cannot speak at the dinner table with their family but can come to the theater and listen and perhaps after that start a conversation. Just using a sort of slightly distanced Othello for racial hatred or a slightly distanced Juliet for the suicide of children you know, whose love is not supported. I think it's an important question uh, whether theater can help. Your work, your very complex work, I am sure has been approached from many theoretical perspectives as well. And I've read some in preparation for this interview um, that uh, many scholars have uh, written about you, especially I read one book when uh, the author is utilizing Judith Butler's theory of gender performativity and using your uh, theater, your plays, as an ideal demonstration of what Judith Butler was writing about the social life, that gender is performative. We learn how to be men and women. We learn and we perform every day in every situation being a man and being a woman. But of course in feminism, um, feminism is very rich as we know it and there are other currents as well and some maybe would find it a bit problematic for women to play um, unproblematic, uh, unquestionably male characters of power, patriarchy. What does it actually give to women, assuming these positions of power? Perhaps it assimilates women into patriarchal masculinist power structures or power order. Well, I don't know about that. It's not the only role the actresses play. They have a varied career across film and television and commercials. But within these great roles, and still there are females playing females in the play. So you can choose. I don't want to play Hamlet. I want to play Ophelia. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I don't know if it's going to make women more masculine to play a role on the stage. But I do know that women are mostly raised to be silent and not participate. So the more intelligent feminists that come to the play, uh, the more men who come and say, I thought it was a great play. I thought you did it brilliantly. And after five minutes, I forgot about the gender. And I was just watching the best Hamlet I've ever seen. That is a win. Yeah? Um, I, I don't think it's possible for the playing of a role to change who you are in terms of your chemistry. But it can change your mind cross-gender adventures existed. How many um, hundreds of great centuries. actresses have played Hamlet? 
It's how many Bernard people have forgotten who Charlotte Cushman was? The greatest actress in the world, the most highly paid actress in the world in the 1800s. She played Macbeth, she played Romeo, she played um, everything. And she played it better than any man alive. And she was celebrated for that. And then when she died, everyone forgot that she existed because it's easy to not look at that. In fact, two of the eight candidates as writer of the Shakespeare canon are women. There's no proof that William Shakespeare wrote the plays. Maybe 30, 40 percent of the people in the world now believe that William Shakespeare actually wrote the plays. And there is even um, theories about his own sexuality and uh, some of the sonnets to whom they were addressed. And they're, they're yes, which makes a lot more sense if you fluid. understand that a woman may have written the sonnets if Mary Sidney wrote the sonnets. So, you know, even for me to sit and say his works is problematic because it's a mystery. There's no proof a man wrote it. It's an assumption. I want to um, show our, uh, our viewers uh, one more segment when uh, which gives a glimpse of your Richard III, who is very um, power-driven and who uses sexuality as a tool for power, which is a very modern thing to, to, to do, at least to reflect upon. When I played Richard III, I could embody the war-torn soul of a man shaped ill by his fortune. I can lurch along his path and feel his situation a bit. He wants to take the Queen's 13-year-old daughter into his bed because he feels that he might profit well from the union. Compassion is not his thing. <laughs> Power is. Look. What is done cannot be now amended. Men shall deal unadvisedly sometimes, which after hours gives leisure to repent. If I did take the kingdom from your sons to make amends, I'll give it to your daughter. If I have killed the issue of your womb to quicken your increase, I will beget mine issue of your blood upon your daughter. Again shall you be mother to a king, and all the ruins of distressful times repaired with double riches of content. What? We have many goodly days to see. Um, do you see parallels uh, when you portray Richard III and you understand his psyche or his motivations between um, him and contemporary political processes globally? Yes, it's horrific. <laughs> Our president, to be, is a horrible misogynist, possibly a rapist, and is um, <laughs> a sovereign means above the rules. That's the meaning of the word, and we must be vigilant and look to history and intervene and say, not my president. You know, I'm going to speak now. You, as we, we mentioned already, make very specific uh, intersections between your personal biography, your personal life, your personal search for your, your identity and uh, Shakespeare. And you tell us very candidly how you first started acting as a boy and why that was. Why did I first start pretending that I was a boy? My mother married again. My stepfather was a drunken, violent ex-Marine, an Irishman, a tyrant king. I tell my mother directly that he's no good, but she was hell-bent on self-destruction. He began to beat and molest us, and I began to copy my brother's moves, his clothing, his stance, in order to build a super defiant defense against the crazy man. My job was to polish his boots. We had to make our beds tightly enough to bounce a coin or we were whipped with a belt. I loved the quiet kinship I found with my brother, the steel strong bond we made of inspecting our wounds together in the bathroom mirror. We gazed into each other's eyes in silent respect. And then shortly after that came uh, one of my absolute favorite segments when you remembered um, your mother one evening um, when your family was living at the Canary Islands mm -hmm. during Franco's regime, a uh, mm -hmm. very strict, patriarchal, totalitarian, Catholic regime, um, and your mother dressing up as a man and finding liberty, if ephemeral, but liberty uh, for just one evening. Playing the female role in life is fraught with precarious balances. 
I'll never forget the evening my mother dressed as a man for carnival night. Women were not allowed to go out and have fun, but she drew on a fake mustache, put a pillow on her belly to disguise the shape of her breasts, pulled on a hat, walked out to the bar in the square, ordered a drink, and began to sing. Un payaso de feria seré, bailando siempre sin fin, dando vueltas de amor viviré, siempre al lado de ti. No sé ni dónde vas, ni dónde me llevarás. Ay, si tú me quisieras, Pero somos marionetas bailando sin fin en las cuerdas del amor, en las cuerdas del amor. Rom, pom, pom, pom. Dressing up as a man, even for one night or as a teenager girl, um, to uh, hide from a, from a predator and a violent uh, stepfather, is liberating. Then, in your experience. Yes, in my experience, in my mother's experience, as I said in the show, my stepfather knocked her across the room for having tried that experiment. In my life, I have been celebrated for the work. I don't know what's coming in the years to come under this new uh, flood of hate crimes. Do you know what I mean? Uh, how many attacks we will suddenly see that we've never seen before. But, you know, not to play the victim on stage is a tremendous opportunity. And then what you do with it, what vulnerability, what intelligence, what power, what remorse, is fascinating. You don't think this somehow then would reinforce the perception that women are weak, men are not, women are victims and men are... Because in masculinity, also there is a gallery, also with Shakespeare, in our social lives, everywhere. Men suffer a lot under patriarchy too because they have to constantly perform, constantly be men enough. And if they're not, if they're unable to assume their dominant position, or if they're anxious or if they like Hamlet, then they're seen as, as weak and, and they are oppressed yes. very much also. So if they fulfill the expectation of gender ascribed to male, they lose so much of their humanity. And that's why often I'm given credit for being a better Romeo or a better Iago or a better Richard III, because I can humanize him through the parts of him that are vulnerable, where a male actor, in order to preserve his masculinity, may not have explored those things, the vulnerabilities, the, the weaker moments. This is very political, what you do with gender and uh, cross-gender uh, um, experience, but there is also another dimension, another political dimension in the, the show that we just saw and in, and in your work. The way you conduct your personal experience, that of your family, of the 20th century tragedies of the Holocaust to Shakespeare. Yeah. Now, Shakespeare, of course, was very political, again, in a straightforward sense. He wrote about politics, he wrote about power, he, he, he unveiled and unpacked this power like no other author in, in his time. And it's no accident, of course, that Bertolt Brecht was studying Elizabethan theatre, as I'm sure you know, to, just to get a better sense of his alienation theatre. But um, what is Shakespeare's significance to you personally? Helped you somehow to reconstruct the image of your father, who em emerges as a central figure towards the end of the, of the play, your father with a remarkable history, personal history, which can be generalized into the history of the 20th century, pretty much European tragedies. This man's life yes. reflects it all. So, um, yeah, so my father, Hans Max Joachim Volpe, probably has some relatives alive still, somewhere, maybe in your broadcast, I'll find a new friend. <laughs> uh, but at the time, everyone in his family was killed um, by the Nazis, and the family had moved from Berlin to Paris to Belgium to try to be safe. Nobody survived except my father, and when I was four, my father took his own life. So I never knew his life. And it was really through researching The Merchant of Venice and trying to do an authentic dramaturgy to see where my own anti-Semitism from being brought up by my Catholic grandmother might reside. Uh, in that 10 years ago, I suddenly discovered the family tree. I discovered that my father's family were rabbis back to the 1600s. I discovered that I had known nothing about his family, that he had been 
described as a passionate man who, who was dead and took his own life, and that part of life was over and we weren't to think about it. Well, I am thinking about it. And, and you found this, out some fascinating I found out some like fascinating it. things about his heroics, that he was celebrated in Time magazine, that he was a, awarded all kinds of uh, kudos for being the bravest man that people knew in his time. Fighting Newspaper the Nazi articles, powers. fighting the Nazi powers, capturing hundreds of Germans, killing hundreds of Germans. But then I also looked at the epilogue, uh, as I looked at the epilogue of Henry V. You know, what is this bravery, courage, time of the heart? What does that word mean? What happens to your heart when that is the shock of the engagement in trying to make a world a better place, that you have to shoot this German boy and that German boy, and finally you've shot 300 German boys. Do you feel better? So when you look at Hamlet or Henry V or Shylock, they don't feel better after their great acts of revenge. And I think that message is written clearly into the plays. But because the productions are so showy on the level of military bravery for Henry V, you forget to listen to the epilogue, that it, it, it won them nothing. I can imagine my father watching all of those dutiful Jews putting their suitcases down and boarding the death trains <coughs> silently, never to return. I can imagine one man trying as courageous as he can to, to stand for justice, for some kind of retribution for millions of murdered Jews. In the play, the Christians taunt Shylock mercilessly, mocking his pain, until finally Shylock erupts, and he vows to take the pound of flesh that he is legally owed by cutting out the heart of Antonio. Why? What's that good for to bait fish with all? If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated my enemies, and what's the reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? <sighs> if you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we shall resemble you in that. So it's the futility of revenge that you're pointing out? You know, the other day I went to the Pincus Synagogue. It was the first synagogue I have ever been in because I haven't been raised as a Jew. I am a Jew, I think. But you're supposed to become a Jew through the, through the mother's line. My mother was a Christian. My father was a Jew. It doesn't matter to me. These are my parents. I want to know why they were destroyed by this hostile world. Such beautiful, intelligent people. So Shylock is destroyed. But I think it's an interesting monologue about revenge because people think it's a monologue about sentimentality, a pity party. I'm a Jew. No, it's one, it's five long sentences saying, if this, then that. If you do this, then I will do it, and I will do it better. And that's not leading anywhere good, yeah? Not in Israel and Palestine, not in the United States, not all over the world where uh, anti-Semitism is having its rise again. Ultimately, we must stand like Mandela did for love and for understanding and for nonviolence. But the road is difficult and the pendulum is swinging back. So I think we must stay vigilant and use our words. And people sometimes forget that the um, Holocaust and Second World War was actually several decades ago, not that long ago. Exactly. Lisa Volpe, thank you so much for being on our program. Oh, this has been a pleasure. pleasure. What an honor. Thank you very thank much. You.